Hey, what's going on? It's John, and it's time for the J Mark cast for Monday, August 15th. What's going on? How are ya? <laughs> Hello, friends and family. I hope you've had a great week. My, mine has been pretty good. It is Sunday morning now, and I thought while I'm walking, I do a little bit of talking and try to record a podcast as I go to get my morning coffee. Today is, like I said, Sunday, the day after uh, one of my buddies, um, what's it called, baby showers. Yeah, he's due to have a, his wife is due to give birth to their baby in about five weeks or so, so pretty exciting stuff there. I was just happy to see him and congratulate him and, you know, give him some little bit of advice, mostly just telling him to enjoy the good parts and then not worry about the parts they get feel difficult and hard because they all kind of work themselves out and pass away on their own without any any <laughs> anything needing from you kind of everything just kind of takes care of itself it's kind of interesting anyways moving on uh last week i got pretty uh <laughs> pissed off about that forbes vitamin d article and uh anyway i i thought i had a pretty good rant and so i was like sending the podcast around to some friends being like oh check it out what do you think and i got mostly positive feedback which is nice so appreciate all the friends who uh listened in and gave me that feedback appreciate and love you all and so uh and then as you know i've started this vitamin d conversation with friends uh one of them just uh sent me an article actually let me see if i can find it it was a CTV article, CTV news article, and it was published, let's see, August 12th. The title is, Vitamin D Supplements Could Treat Depression Symptoms, Analysis Finds. So, okay, let's see what they say. If I had to just comment on the title right off the bat is, I know a lot of people are affected by seasonal affective disorder, right? I think that's what it is, like SAD, right? That's what the uh, acronym stands for. And obviously that happens in the wintertime when people have the least amount of sunshine available for making vitamin D. So that does make sense. Could could be possible just on a surface level, kind of looking at the title and thinking about it. All right, so um, article starts with, Vitamin D supplements could alleviate symptoms of depression in adults. A recent meta-analysis of studies has found. Oh yeah, of course, meta-analysis. You know what? I'm just going to do a quick little comment here and say that I hate meta-analyses. Because um, what they are is the a meta-analysis is just somebody takes a bunch of separate analyses that are usually done in completely different contexts, but they group them together and try to make some sort of common, I don't know, analysis based on all these completely different studies and then make some sort of generalization that then people take on to to mean that that's the absolute truth and anything that goes against that must be false like meta-analyses are crap you got to look at each each individual study one at a time look at their methods see what they've done and then judge based on that like analyze that for yourself to be like does that make sense what they did were they actually able to prove what they said in their hypothesis that they're trying to prove or disprove it because you actually can't prove anything right ultimately in science all you can do is disprove something that's all science is you could go on disproving all the possible hypotheses that you could make and then the final hypothesis that can't be disproven is the one that is most likely true and that's the one we go go with until we gather new data new knowledge that is able to uh, help us make new hypotheses and then find new ways of disproving them. And then the cycle goes on and on and on. That That's what science is. So ultimately, like these meta-analyses are not science. It's just uh, somebody who takes um, statistics and, you know, tries to apply it in a way on these studies that from an outside perspective, it actually doesn't doesn't make sense at all. But Anyways, enough of a rant there. I didn't think I was going to talk all that much about that, but there you go. Going off again unnecessarily. 
Okay, so researchers from Finland, Australia, and the U.S. outline their findings in a peer-reviewed pub- paper published in Critical Reviews in Food Science and Nutrition on July 11th. They analyzed 41 studies looking at the efficacy of vitamin D among adults when it came to addressing depressive symptoms. Okay, 41 studies. Like, <sighs> like you'd have to look at those individual studies all 41 of those studies to really get a sense of whether the claims this meta-analysis makes actually make sense based on what you kind of, you know, uh, make sense of from those 41 studies based on the methods, based on the results, based on everything. All right. It says each of the studies involved randomized placebo-controlled trials the results showed that vitamin D supplements were more effective than a placebo at addressing depressive symptoms in adults who had been diagnosed with depression. But in healthy individuals who were not diagnosed with depression or any psychiatric condition, the researchers found the supplements were less effective than a placebo. Vitamin D supplements were also not found to be effective in adults over 65 years of age. Okay. So the first thing makes a lot of sense to me. People with depression, they probably have some sort of issue going on where increased levels of vitamin D could have a huge impact on what is going on internally in terms of like their metabolism and all these genes that are affected their expression is affected by vitamin D. Remember every cell, I said this last time too, every cell in the body has vitamin D receptors. And vitamin D is involved in the expression of like thousands of genes. So you can't underestimate what it can do. But the second comment here, about 65 years of age, it's like not effective for those people. Like, first of all, at what doses? Like it doesn't say that and not effective for what exactly? For, I guess, uh, in this specific case, it's the depressive symptoms. So yeah, again, you'd have to look at the specific studies that, and, and the methods involved to, to be able to actually say if this claim that this study is making is true or not. The lead author, Thomas Mikola, of the University of Eastern Finland, warned that there was a risk of bias among the studies involved in the analysis, as many people did not provide descriptions on potential compounding variables such as ethnicity, diet, BMI, sunlight exposure, and amount of exercise. So yeah, there you go. Like, just goes to show that like the context in which these studies are done are completely different from one another. And so because you're lacking all these confounding variables that you'd have to, you'd need to control for to make sure that the studies actually, you know, make sense and are giving you some sort of a, an output that you can contextualize and be like, okay, we've controlled for all these variables. So the outcome we see must be because of this one variable we changed. It's not like that. All these variables are all loosey goosey everywhere. Like nobody knows what anyone, <laughs> anyone's actual context is. So like just to say i don't know just to say that like you can conclusively trust the outcome of this study through this kind of like an analysis it's just i i don't buy it meta-analyses suck you have to look at individual studies one by one and this is what the main uh, lead author is saying as well despite the broad scope of this meta-analysis the certainty of evidence remains low due to the heterogeneity of populations studied and due to the risk of bias associated with larger numbers of studies. Yeah, they're just saying the same thing. And then it's the classic uh, authors say more research is needed to draw accurate conclusions on whether vitamin D could be used to treat depression. Yeah, it's the classic thing that scientists always say, well, we need to do more research, you know, because we don't know anything. <laughs> uh, and then I did take a look at this meta-analysis and like I said, I don't like these because it's all about statistics. And like I took like the most basic level of statistics in university for my Bachelor of Science degree. 
just enough to be able to like you know tell a difference between significantly different and like what uh, certain types of distributions look like and stuff like that but the way they apply it in these kinds of meta analysis i am not able to tell at all if like this makes sense at all or does not so it's kind of almost pointless for me to read this stuff i do try to go through it every once in a while see if i can pick out certain things that like i can point out as oh this makes sense and this doesn't and usually what you have to do is you go to the you have to go to the methods section to be able to you know really point this stuff out because uh then you can just be like oh they did that and then they're trying to make this other claim based off of that that doesn't make sense or it does make sense and then one thing that i did find was I can see if I can find it back, but basically it was just talking about how the uh, range of doses in all these studies that they looked at was was such an insanely large ra range that it's like, okay, what? how can you make any conclusion based on these large variants of like what the trials are trying? Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. Okay, it says, the single doses of vitamin D varied from 400 international units to 500,000 international units. And as calculated per intervention day, from 400 IU to approximately 14,000 IU. So that was the range daily. So some people got very little, and some people, like got what I would consider a large large dose large enough to actually make a difference so it's like then you have to like why why would they include those studies with the low doses I don't know I guess you have to include that to show uh, um, yeah what what the threshold effect is right so I don't know but they in this study from like the basic abstract that I, that I read they don't really contextualize the dosage very very well at all so it's like you can, you really got to dig through all this research to be able to be certain to know what you're talking about but like that's not what happens right like most people will just read the Forbes article title saying stop taking vitamin D already or even this, this, this one, right? The CD, CTV news article, like, oh, vitamin D helps depression. Like, maybe, maybe not. Like, I don't think we can say based on the study. It's a, it's a, it's just a statistical study that combines four random, of not four, 41 other random studies together. That's hard to, like, you know, see if there's like actual congruency between all these types of, uh, uh, patients that were used in the studies and in terms of like what the actual treatment they got is it seems like there's just like 41 completely different studies so why would we find any common <laughs> i don't know thread among them but apparently they do and you know that that's science for you at this point science has just become like statistical masturbators basically let's find Let's find some random numbers and put them together and see if we can make any any sense of it. Like that's not that's not science. Anyway, enough of a rant there. <laughs> so moving on to uh, another health related thing that I wanted to talk about, which was related to eyesight. Actually, let me see if I can find it. Interesting thread that I came across related to eyesight, and I thought I'd, I'd like to share this one on the pod. John Constance. Here we go. The eyeglass industry makes $140 billion a year, correcting your vision. Correcting in quotations. But there's a little dirty secret they don't want you to know. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, so a thread from a Twitter uh, account, at John Constance. He says, poor eyesight isn't just about genetics. Your environment also plays a role. 100% agree, agree with that. It's always the combination of genetics and environment, nature and nurture, not either one. Today we spend most of our time indoor staring at our screens within the dark confines of offices. It's taken a toll on our vision. Your eyes need to exercise in order to stay sharp and healthy. 100% agree with that too. Like, 
And I'm back. I just had to uh, pause the uh, recording there to go get the coffee because I arrived at the coffee shop and just had to stand in line there. I didn't want to be talking to my phone as uh, I'm standing in line around a bunch of people. So I had to hit the pause button there. Got my coffee. Now I can get back to that vision thread that I thought was very interesting. I thought I'd share on the podcast. So again, John Constas on Twitter, he was saying... Good vision meant life or death for our ancestors. They needed to search the horizon for food to feed their families. Finding berries and mushrooms was also was also necessary. If poor vision was purely genetic, natural selection would have wiped it out of the gene pool. Why? Because not correcting, not correctly identifying poisonous food or mistaking a snake for a tree branch meant you die. Death equals not able to pass on. DNA. <laughs> now, you've probably been wondering how is this possible? We've been told all our lives that poor, poor eyesight meant classes forever and that your vision will get worse over time. In today's world, there's some truth to that statement. You can change that though. Your eyes are surrounded by muscles that move them in all directions. Like all muscles, they follow the adage, use it or lose it. By not looking at faraway distances and being outside in sunlight, these structures weaken. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I always like personally try to look at far, look at faraway objects if I have a faraway horizon, and then I also try to uh, like study the shapes of faraway, like outlines of faraway objects, and and also move my eyes around from like uh, corner to corner, like top to bottom, side to side, diagonally as well. Try to like see how far I can move my eyes in that one direction and those kinds of like, I think I've heard them be described as like eye yoga movements. Like they're just movements of your eye, like everyone can do them. Anyways, the thread goes on. Your eyes also control your diurnal rhythm or body clock. This clock runs on sunlight. Being stuck inside and not exposing yourself to sunlight messes up the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is vital for our health. Oh, there's a kid crying here. <laughs> they, they were smiling right after that. <laughs> Anyways, being stuck inside and not exposing yourself to sunlight messes up the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is vital for eye health. It literally changes the structure of your eyeball. Myopia or nearsightedness is not being able to see things from far away. This happens because your eye elongates due to lack of sun exposure. The light that enters misses your retina, vision processing tissue, so the image you see is blurry. Keeping your eye healthy is fairly simple. You need exposure to sunlight. The average room is 20 times less bright than being outside on a sunny day. Get as much time as you can and bask in the healing rays. Make it your priority. Hmm. Very cool. Another tip is to spend time out in nature, staring at la landscapes or objects in the distance. Train your eyes to stay sharp. Give them a challenge. You need to be proactive. Poor vision shouldn't be a life sentence. Give your eyes the environment they deserve to thrive. Spend more time outside and less time in front of screens. Eat more vitamin A rich food like organ meats or fatty fish, or you'll end up needing stronger lens prescriptions every few years. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, it's any, it's like anything. If you're not paying attention to it, you're not, uh, you know, measuring it in some way, tracking it in some way, then over time, it is probably deteriorating because that's what happens. Nature deteriorates. Is that word for things uh, being random? I'm going to have to Google this. All right, I looked it up. It's entropy. Entropy. The universe has infinite entropy, and it's constantly deteriorating due to it. So unless you're using your mind to make order from chaos of, of the universe, you are just letting entropy take over. So that's how I like to think of it. <laughs> Vision's just like anything else. Movement, movement is medicine. What kind of movement can you do to, you know, 
change your vision. You can move your eyes, you know, in every which direction, and then you can move your your focus, where you're focusing your eye, right? You can look at far away distances, you can look at near distances, and it's everything in between. And you can even, yeah, go back and forth. Just a little bit of that every day can go a long way. And then in addition to all the sun, sunlight and everything, I guess, exposure. So that was interesting. And I liked the thread, so I just kind of replied if he had any suggested further reading. And he actually replied back to me and gave me an, uh, a link to uh, endmyopia.org, which uh, when you click on it, the title page says, Your eyes aren't broken. <laughs> Nearsightedness is not an illness but a hundred billion dollar business. Wow. Cool. Well, look into it for yourselves, I guess. That's that's all I'm going <laughs> to read on that point. And then what else did I want to discuss today? Let's see. We are on block height 748,964. The price of Bitcoin is trading at 24,508 US dollars. One. U.S. Kakbak will buy you 4,081 Satoshis. Remember that it said Satoshi is, well, first of all, it's the name of the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. But a Satoshi is also the small, is what has been named the smallest subunit of Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be subdivided into 100 million subunits. And just as an ode to the creator, I suppose, people have decided to name that small one billion, 100 million subunit, they call it a Satoshi or Sat for short. I guess it kind of sounds like Sen, so it's kind of cool, maybe catchy. I don't know, I like it. So Satoshis it is, or Sats. If you want to know some uh, funny like Bitcoin phrases, Bitcoinisms, I guess you could call them. Uh, one of them is stay humble, stack Sats. <laughs> If you want to stack sats and you're in Canada, use ShakePay. They're a good, uh, reputable exchange, and I have a referral link in the description of the podcast. Uh, there's other exchanges too. You don't have to use them. What else? All right, that's a little <laughs> Bitcoin uh, intro from Bitpool.io, I suppose. But let's just get back to that uh, thread that I wanted to share. This is a thread from. Uh, this uh, account at stack hodler and uh, here's what he says so I convinced mom to become a whole coiner at 13,000 yesterday she asked me if I thought it would ever go back up here's what I told her the long-term thesis has not changed governments around the world are still in a debt trap and central banks will be forced to devalue currency to avoid defaulting on debt. Yeah, 100%. There's no way out of it. Bitcoin is finite and adoption is growing. Fiat is infinite and people are fleeing it any way they can. People speculate on JPEGs, which is like those NFTs you might have heard about and meme stocks such as um, AMC I guess and then GameStop yeah maybe that one what was I going with this yeah people speculate on JPEGs and meme stocks when the money is broken most just want to own a home and provide for their family but the need to preserve purchasing power becomes a primary concern when the money fails Bitcoin fills this basic need for a growing number of people yes Bitcoin has fallen, but so have bonds, bonds, gold, and other hedges that normally help investors ride out volatility. So what's happening? Well, the Fed has withdrawn liquidity and raised interest rate rates, the Fed meaning the American Central Bank. Lending has slowed down and there's less fiat sloshing around. It can't last. The debt trap will force a pivot eventually. The U.S. has a debt to GDP of... 124%, which means they owe 24% <laughs> more than they can make. So unless they can increase their GDP substantially, the debt is just going to keep growing. <laughs> Other countries are far worse off. 
Options to avoid defaulting on national debt are 1. Massive ta taxes. 2. Austerity. Spend less to be frugal. Or 3. Devalue the currency and pay back in nominal terms. So let's go over those <laughs> choices and see which ones are likely to happen. So number one, taxes are unpopular and people would need to liquidate assets destroying the boomer wealth they are trying to tax and it still wouldn't be enough. So that's not likely to happen. Two, austerity would destroy jobs and lower GDP, decreasing debt to GDP. So that's not likely to happen. And so three, currency devaluation is the best bad option. So if we know the long-term game is currency devaluation, the best thing to do is to hold a finite asset that can't be debased and has growing adoption, preferably outside any one jurisdiction, something that you can easily take with you during times of chaos. Then be patient. If Bitcoin bottom ends up being 17,000 after an epic wave of liquidations, then that's still very impressive performance considering the 2020 bottom was close to $4,000. That's a 325% increase bottom to bottom over a couple of years. Well, we'll see if that actually holds up. <laughs> it's a little early to be calling that, I suppose. And it goes, um, trading and volatility can make two years in Bitcoin feel like a decade. But to be a successful hodler, you need to be able to lengthen your time horizon. Bitcoin forces you to think long term. And when we crash from 420,000 to 200,000, you'll be the one who's chilling. So yes, I do expect Bitcoin to go back up and quite a lot. There will be dramatic volatility on the way, but we're living through the end of a big debt cycle. Central banks will try to keep things under control, but ultimately currencies will need to be debased. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. There's going to be no choice because like with all this increase in interest rates that's been happening, right? All these small developing countries that have dollar denominated debts are all of a sudden squeezed hard to be able to make their print payments on, on the debts they own like with bigger payments, right? Because interest, interest rates are up and so they're not going to be able to keep up. So something's going to break soon. And if it does break, then it, I don't know, like to what level are they going to let things go off? Right? Like, I'm not sure. We'll see. That's why it's a crazy time to be alive, but something's going <laughs> to go down. So just got to be prepared. And this was, that's what this guy's saying, you know, own something that uh, is finite and something that can be moved easily. And that's, that's Bitcoin, right? All right. How long have I been going on for? I can go a bit longer. Why not? There's another thread that I wanted to discuss. And then I think after that, we'll call it a day. This one was interesting because it's about emission schedule of Bitcoin, something we don't think about the emission schedule of money, right? Like, if we think about fiat money, there's a certain amount that's out there, but we can never actually know how much there is. And that amount is constantly growing as new loans are made. And as whether that be from corporations, from individuals, or from banks, or from, uh, you guessed it, nations, right? The biggest one is the nation state that does the, the largest amount of uh, um loans that takes the largest amount of loans and so with that the total money supply is constantly growing and which is part of the reason why we're seeing crazy high inflation um uh prints like uh, in terms of uh, consumer prices anyway i mean we've had high inflation with regards to assets for a long time definitely since like uh the covid crash like the asset inflation has been insane it did cool off a little bit recently but it's kind of seems to be restarting back up again. We'll see, or my, or it might just be a bear market rally. But anyways, not to get too sidetracked here. But uh, essentially, the total money supply when it comes to U.S. dollars or other fiat currencies is unknown, but knowably constantly growing. But what about the 
supply of Bitcoin. People always say there's 21 million, which is true, but like, what does that actually mean? Like, does that mean there's 21 million now, or there will eventually be 21 million? How is new Bitcoin made? Like, there's a lot of questions that come with this. So I found an interesting, interesting thread that kind of can go into this a little bit. So let's go over this. This is from a Twitter profile at John Cantrell 97. John C A N T R E L L 97. He says Bitcoin is designed to emit a total of 21 million coins with the last bits of coin to be mined in the year 2140. And this is an approximate number. We can't know exactly when it will be just because of like certain things that I'm not going to get into, but we can't know exactly when it will be, but around that year. What exactly is the supply schedule and what happens after 2140? The supply schedule is one of the most important aspects of Bitcoin. Let me break it down for you. Every block that is mined is allowed to produce a certain amount of Bitcoin. This amount is called a block reward and it started at 50 Bitcoin per block. Every 210,000 blocks, which is roughly four years or so, this reward halves. So it went from 50 to 25, from 25 to 12 and a half, from 12 and a half to six and a quarter. That's where, what we're at now, the epoch of six and a quarter, and then it will continue to half until 2140. This is what is referred to as the supply schedule. The exact parameters aren't important. It's the fact that it is known ahead of time and cannot change that makes Bitcoin so revolutionary. Everyone can know exactly how much Bitcoin will exist at any point in the future. Okay, but if the block reward is what incentivizes miners to invest in equipment to mine, then what happens when the reward drops to zero in 2140? So I'm just going to take a little pause here and try to explain this a little bit more. So talking about miners investing equipment to mine. So with every new block, so what is a new block, right, in the blockchain? So the new block is every time you want to make a transaction and send some Bitcoin from your control to somebody else's control, and you need to write that transaction down in the blockchain, in, in the Bitcoin blockchain. In order to do that, you make that transaction and then you also apply a fee with it to give to miners to write that transaction in the newest coming block and then so the miners compete with each other to see who's the first one to mine the the, the newest block or write down these transactions and if whoever wins this competition uh, as a reward they get to collect all the fees that people paid to get their transactions written plus on top of that this block reward which, uh, which is basically how new Bitcoin is created. Okay, so then, okay, back to the question he says, but if the block reward is what incentivizes miners to invest in equipment to mine, then what happens when the reward drops to zero in 2140? If miners are important in securing the network, then how will they be incentivized to continue mining? One thing to keep in mind is that every transaction in a block must include a fee that is paid to the miner. These fees will exist will still exist in 2140, and depending on the price of Bitcoin by then, they will be enough to sustain a certain amount of hash power. It's important to understand there is a direct relationship between the revenue generated from each block and the hash power on the network. As the price goes up, miners are willing to spend more money and more hash power to earn the extra revenue. Will fees alone be enough? It's hard to answer with certainty because the answer depends on another difficult question. How much hash power is enough to secure the network? Some would argue there's already orders of magnitude more hash than is truly needed. I'll leave this question for another day. So what happens in 2140? Blocks will continue to be mined every 10 minutes and the miners of those blocks will be rewarded with the transaction fees. The question is, how much hash power will there be and how distributed will it be? I'm optimistic there'll be enough. Yeah, so it's interesting to think about, like, 2140 is a long time away from now. We will be gone by then. <laughs> but I want Bitcoin to continue existing into 2140 and beyond it. And so we want to make sure that it's designed in a way that it makes sense for it to continue to exist. And I think it does because the transaction fees are going to continue increasing over time. And they will naturally just 
get to a balancing point where people pay enough money for enough mining to be to exist to be able to secure the network. But I don't know. I'm not smart enough to think about this uh, uh, that well, I guess. That's why we got smarter people like designing these things and uh, playing out the game theory and trying to think about how this can all work out. But in the meantime, it's just, just interesting to <laughs> read about and share with you guys. All right, I think I'm done. This was a little bit of a, a less exciting ending than I was hoping, but whatever. We did it together. Whoever listened in, appreciate you for spending the time with me and, you know, learning together. This is all new for me as well, but hopefully this outdoor version of the podcast was uh, not too bad and the sound quality turns out okay. But uh, thanks for joining me on another episode of the JMart Cast. As always, if you haven't yet, please take a second to rate the podcast either on Spotify or Apple Podcasts as well. If you want to help the podcast some more, don't forget to share an episode with a friend. And that's it for now. As always, stay active. Be grateful. J Martin out.